I'm sitting here in D.C. with the rare opportunity to speak with someone who served in the innermost circles of the U.S. war machine. Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson is a former U.S. Army Airborne Ranger who flew over 1,000 combat missions in Vietnam. He was National Security Advisor to the Reagan administration and later served as Chief of Staff to Colin Powell during the Bush administration. Uh, you're a retired Army officer. You're a Republican. Uh, given your inside experience in the government and military, how would you explain the purpose of U.S. foreign policy? Today, <laughs> today the purpose of U.S. foreign policy is to support the complex that we've created in the national security state that is fueled, funded, and powered by interminable war and the ramifications thereof. That's a sad commentary on what America has become but it's a realistic and, I think, honest appraisal of what America has become. Mm -hmm. Has it ever been about altruism? Um, you could say there were even altruistic aspects to the slaughter and ethnic cleansing of Native Americans from the Mississippi to the Pacific Coast by Phil Sheridan's Army of the West if you wanted to really dip into the bag and find something. But I don't think overall and comprehensively it's been altruistic. It's been about sheer power. And lately, it's not even been about realistic application of that sheer power or realistic e attempts to expand it. It's been more or less so failed in its overall general aspects that it has diminished our real power in the world. And this is what concerns me most seriously because history, history demonstrates, I think, that this is what empires do when they're getting ready to collapse. They began to be so zealous of their own power and its expansion that they actually decrease their power until it becomes inevitable that they cease to exist or they don't exist in the same form they did when they were an empire. And you've talked about the capital interests that are behind pretty much every U.S. military intervention in the last decade, if not century. What sort of economy are we waging war in today and what capital interests would you say are behind the war on terror? After World War II, the United States engaged in a monstrous twilight conflict, if you will, that it calls the Cold War. It's probably a pretty apt term. In that process, it built up what are the appurtenances now of a national security state, the military-industrial congressional complex, all the armaments industry that goes into that, the far-flung basing structure we have all over the world, which now is eight or nine hundred places that we have little colonial dots, if you will, imperial dots, um, and to the wars that we're fighting and now almost interminably. All of this is, a, is the leftover of what we did during that Cold War to include physical expenditures beyond the scope even of human imagination. We have spent so much money on maintenance of our empire that it is becoming a critical part of it too. Our debt now is something like $18 trillion. Uh, unparalleled debt in my mind in the, in the history of empire. In, in constant dollars or in current dollars. So this is a situation that's unsustainable, but it has come to a point where the power structure, which I would define as both the financial apparatus that this empire has generated, and the economic aspects of it, which are less and less industrialized and productive, therefore, a real economy in other words, and more and more playing with money and the interest on money and capital in general, as Thomas Piketty has pointed out in his book, Capitalism of the 21st Century, so eloquently, we now have more capital awash in the world than we have earned income. As I say, earned income is a very second place in the world. Capital is the real driving force in the world, and it's capital that's passed on from family to family, from uh, generation to generation, and therefore corruptive and poisonous. We're in real trouble right now 
because of what this empire has generated, because of the incentives and motivations of it, and because it's basically run by about 1% of the people, if not, if not fewer, in this country, constituting essentially a plutocracy. There are 400 families, 400 wealth centers, private wealth centers in the United States constituted around a family structure that equal the gross domestic product of Brazil. Today I read a percentage which I can't even recall, it had so many zeros in front of it, but it was much less than 1% of the country has the approximate wealth of the GDP of India. So we're talking about a concentration of wealth and a concentration of capital, which is not productive wealth unless it is actually going back into the real economy to generate industry that produces something that is, it's unconscionable. It's reprehensible in many ways because what you've got is the rest of the country and in many respects the rest of the world living off the rest of the scraps. And it's totally unsustainable, as you're mentioning, yes. that this is a trajectory is that is not going to last. Not um, sustainable. Behind the belligerents waging war, there are certain industries that are in play that continue to garner interests, extract resources. Look at what's happening in Syria right now, for example. Just a microcosmic example. The Air Force is about to run out of ordnance. It has dropped so many bombs and shot so many cruise missiles that it's about to run out of ordnance. Well, I will guarantee you that companies like Raytheon and Lockheed and others who make these armaments are salivating because they are going to be making another round of these armaments and, and, armaments and, and into the interminable unknown future. They're going to be making these armaments. It's incredible what we what we're doing. And in fact, they they are salivating at that. Uh, Lockheed, Boeing, um, all of these different institutions, defense institutions, are openly talking about what a great um, benefit this is to them. The yes. Syria war, all of these escalations. I wanted to read you a quick fact. In 2008, the Government Accountability Office found that over 2,400 former generals were employed at 52 of the biggest defense contractors as senior executives and acquisition officers. A high percentage of retired general officers retire, go straight into jobs in the defense industry, making well over six figures. Um, often with the corporations they dealt with while serving. How does this revolving door <laughs> uh, function? I mean, how close is this relationship in terms of actual foreign policy creation? It's so close that you actually had during the Iraq war, and as far as my history lessons go, it's the first time it's occurred this way, and now is going on continuously. General officers who not only go out into the armaments industry and its associated paraphernalia and make money, based on their influence gain while in service, you actually have them going out and joining the media and making the media more conversant with and attuned to and want war. So you actually have general officers who will go out and go to CNN, go to MSNBC, go to Fox News, and they will get, again, your six-figure salaries for being the security experts on those news shows and they will report to the American people the dire need for this continued conflict, the dire need for soldiers on the ground in Syria, the dire need for more war. It's incredible what has happened in that respect. That's not a direct in, uh, uh, contribution to the armaments industry, but it's certainly a very vivid, very vivid contribution to the warmongering and to the interminable state of war. Is it the interlocking board of directorates on these companies or is it just the advertising that's straight injected into the corporate media? I wish it were something that you could put your finger on like that. It's so many different things, including what you just said, but not necessarily consciously or coherently, except in some cases, I think. Um, it, it's all of these things contributing, and it's not any one of them, as Eisenhower said in his farewell address, it's not something you put your finger on and say, aha, that's malicious. That's, that's intent. It's not only complicit, it's intent. It's not that. It's this accumulation of vast power that's oriented towards what first increases its power and second, what makes it rich, that comes together and causes this. If it were something that you could root out and you can hand over to the FBI or to the Supreme Court or someone to adjudicate, it'd be a different matter, I think. Not that it would get done very easily, but it'd be a different matter. It's not something like that. It's pernicious. It's, as Eisenhower said, it's in every state house, in every federal office building. It's even in every home in America. 
It is this unconscious, sometimes, power-driven aspect of it that makes it so difficult to combat. In fact, I'll sit here and be a pessimist, a cynic, and I'll say we aren't going to we aren't going to correct this until something truly serious happens to right the ship of state, which might also sink the ship of state. Now we have every other general officer, admiral, walking out and signing up with glee to work for armaments. Well, other than the egregious, unethical nature of of how this functions, I mean. What is the legal caveat to how this is actually working? Is it just a machine that's working on its own and just continues to become more pernicious as time goes on? Um, they're not the most competent people in the world. They're not the most capable people in the world. And they're not the most, shall we say, professional people in the world. That's part of it. But a second part of it is it's become the thing to do. It's become de rigueur. I mean, it's what you do. If you serve 30, 35 years, you expect to have a six-figure salary with someone like uh, Raytheon or Halliburton or Booz Allen Hamilton. We haven't even talked about the Beltway bandits that do more intelligence than the CIA. And I use that term very loosely there, intelligence. Um, but it is, a, it is a corporate complex that is growing and it, it surrounds everything else, including what I call fateful decision-making, which is the decision-making to send young men and women to die for state purposes. And speaking of the young men and women who go to die, um, you know, there seems to be a huge class stratification, of course, between the people who are making the policy and the people who are actually giving their lives on the battlefield. I mean, if you join the military in today's age, whose interests are you serving when you do put your life on the line? You're serving what one veteran in my seminar at Women Mary said to me not too long ago, about three weeks ago, Army veteran, Iraq, Afghanistan. You're serving the ulterior purposes of the leadership of the country. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, you're serving corporate and commercial interest. You're serving the interest of people who bureaucratically are seeking power within the structure. And you're serving the interest of what is basically an incompetent governing process. Wow, that was a pretty powerful statement, I told him. And he said, yep, and I'll never go back again. I guarantee you that because I didn't realize that until I was about halfway through my last tour in, Afga in Afghanistan. Let's talk about the draft. Uh, it hasn't been in place for some time. On one hand, you have the military des so desperate that they're paying NFL and sports stadiums for pro-military propaganda. On the other hand, you have women that are now being pushed to enlist in the draft. Uh, what are these measures of desperation mean, and, and what do you think about the draft? It really isn't an all-volunteer force. It's an all-recruited force because we're spending billions of dollars to entice these people who feel that they don't have many other prospects into the armed forces. We're, we're bringing them into a service that's supposed to be professional, disciplined, and altruistic. We're bringing them in with the most heinous of selfish, greedy purpose. We're paying them what they couldn't make otherwise. We're giving them bonuses. It is so bad now that the cost for personnel in my Army, and to a certain extent in the Marine Corps, is coming close to being 50% of the cost of that service on an annual basis. Um, if for no other reason the all-volunteer force is going to bankrupt the Defense Department, so they're going to have to look at some other options. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your role in the Bush administration uh, during the lead-up to one of the most devastating wars ever perpetrated by the empire, of course, the Iraq War. You not only served as Colin Powell's chief of staff, but you prepared his infamous speech to the UN about Iraq and its weapons of mass destruction. How did you miss the faulty nature of the intelligence given your week-long analysis, given the stakes? I've looked at it from a much more, uh, shall we say, soul-piercing way. Not only was the intelligence picture a failure on the part of the intelligence agencies for various reasons, it was also cherry-picked by the vice president. It was put together to a certain extent by the Office of Special Plans and Doug Feist shop in the Pentagon. And it was largely orchestrated, as the MI6, the British memo said, it was orchestrated, shaped around the policy, or the policy was, was essentially you know, fed with intelligence that would shape it, would feed it. Um, so there were a number of reasons for the failure. There were a number of reasons for my own personal failure. I lament those reasons. I'll never forget the occasion. I'll go to my grave remembering it. Um, but I can certainly, from an academic point of view, see how 
And this, this is sad, and it frightens me to a certain extent, how this happened in the past, has happened in the past, or whether it's something in the future. For example, let me give you a vivid example. I'll tell you how I looked at the immediate reports that Bashar al-Assad had used chemical weapons in Syria a year or so ago. I said, bull, I'll believe it when I see evidence that it actually happened. And you know, I went to every person I knew in the intelligence community and every person outside the United States I knew to include two people who were in Syria at the time and I knew, knew what was going on and I respected their vision and their knowledge. None of them could confirm for me, not a single one, that Bashar al-Assad used those chemical weapons. Instead, there were possibilities they were used by other parties in Syria as well as Bashar al-Assad and frankly the evidence looked more strongly for other parties than the president. So I still think there is high potential for this kind of manipulation of intelligence, this kind of fabrication of intelligence, and this kind of refusal to take dissent in the leadership in this country right now today. And I'll tell you very seriously, I'm very skeptical of the intelligence establishment and what it says. Right. I mean, I always thought it was weird that the UN weapons inspectors were there on the ground, and that's when Bashar al-Assad decided to use the chemical weapons, right. when he already knew that was the red line. This whole red line mantra, I think, is really interesting, because why should weapons of mass destruction of any sort be that red line to actually legitimize the invasion and occupation of a sovereign nation? I wanted to say one more thing about the case. One of the biggest resonating factors, I think, in this speech was Saddam's um, anthrax stockpiles and bioweapons labs, considering the fact that America had just been traumatized by its own anthrax, anthrax attacks where five people tragically lost their lives. Why did you choose to hinge so much on anthrax in the speech? No, as a matter of fact, we, we winnowed that thing to death. We threw tons of stuff out that we simply looked at and said, all this is is an extrapolation from 1991 or 92. In other words, we looked at it and said, the CIA has no evidence that Saddam has done what they're saying he's done. All they've done is made a linear projection. If he was producing six ounces in 1991, and we knew that positively from the inspectors after the war, then he's now got 46 ounces because he could do two a year, you know, or whatever. That's what they've done. Of course, it came out that the anthrax came from our own bioweapons lab. Um, the final report from the FBI found no hard evidence linking Bruce Ivan to the attack. Well, I don't know that. And I can't tell you why I don't know that, but I don't know that. I don't know it with the clarity with which you just expressed it. That's what the FBI said. Yeah, well, the FBI is as incompetent as any other bureaucratic entity within the federal structure, so... Right, but I think, I think it is pretty much conclusive that it came from within... I mean, the, the biograde of the anthrax came from within the U.S. establishment. It wouldn't surprise facility. me. It wouldn't surprise me. Well, but... let's talk about what was your kind of deciding factor to speak out and be so vocal. Torture. Really? I, I, it tortured us. I, I, when Powell came through my door um, in May, I guess it was, of 2004 and told me about some photographs that were going to come out, may be made public, about a place called Abu Ghraib in Iraq. By the time I walked out of the State Department, I was ready to, you know, I was ready to go find somebody and cut his throat because I, I knew that the United States had been involved in heinous activities in Vietnam. I knew they'd been involved in heinous activities in the Philippines. Indeed, a Brigadier General, as I recall, had machine gunned a thousand people in a ditch in the Philippines. And Teddy Roosevelt had sent him a telegram congratulating him until people found out what he'd really done. And then Teddy had to kind of withdraw that approval. Um, but I knew we'd done some really bad things in the past, particularly in war. But I never, never knew in any time in our history where those bad things had not only been authorized at the highest levels in the land, but encouraged by the highest levels in the land. And I mean the president and the vice president of the United States and some of the cabinet officers. They were complicit in this. They gave instructions that they damn well knew were going to cause the armed forces of the United States to involve themselves in violations of the Geneva Conventions, the law of war, and the manuals that they operated under. That just threw me. That, that, that I said, I can't stay silent anymore. I'm going to speak out. And looking back at the horrors of the administration, as you mentioned, the torture, wanton detention, um, and then, of course, the illegal war, essentially, that was 
based on false pretenses that cost the lives of a million Iraqis. Um, do you think that any members of the Bush administration should be charged with war crimes? I've said so in the past. I do think they should be charged. I, I think six lawyers in particular ought to be disbarred immediately. Uh, they should have been disbarred immediately. I think they should probably also be tried. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Soldiers have been continuously dying in Afghanistan. It's America's longest war. Um, today they're still facing death, horrific injuries for essentially no purpose, it seems. I mean, be how careful. do you think they should understand the war in Afghanistan? What, what do you think their purpose should be? The war in Afghanistan has morphed. It's not about Al Qaeda anymore, and it's not about the Taliban anymore. It's about China, Russia, the soft underbelly, which is mostly Muslim of Russia, about Pakistan, about Iran, about Syria, about Iraq, about whether a Kurdistan is stood up or not and ultimately about oil, water, and energy in general. And the U.S. presence in Afghanistan, I'll predict right now, will not go away for another half century. Oh my God, that's a horrible thought. And it will grow. It will not decrease, it will grow. And let's talk about strategic influence, especially, you know, we see this Cold War resurrection going on right now. As someone who's lived throughout the Cold War, the schism within the establishment when it comes to Russia and this new posturing with Russia, after the reunification of Germany, there was a promise on behalf of NATO that it would not continue to build up. What has not instead happened? Not one inch further east is what Jim Baker, Secretary of State, said to Edward Shepard Nasser. What interests are behind the buildup? Why do we want more countries in NATO? Because then Lockheed Martin and Raytheon and Boeing and others can sell to them. Mm -hmm. Then the Soviets, now the Russians, won't be selling to them. Why do we want Ukraine? Don't we have enough? I mean... Empire never has enough. That's the nature of imperial power. It never has enough. Have you ever watched Battlestar Galactica or, <laughs> or, or Star Wars, you know, or Game of Thrones? <laughs> Empire never has enough power. It never has enough wealth. It never has a, a more stable status quo. It has an increasingly instable status quo, and so its efforts are ever more frenetic to protect that status quo, its power and its wealth, and to even expand them. That's the nature of empire. And that's what we are now. That's what we are. Everyone's protestations to the contrary, that's what we are. Mm -hmm. Depending on whose report you read, about a third, 20%, I'll say, to 30% of Russia's heavy armaments industry is in Ukraine. What do they do for tanks? What do they do for their heavy armaments in their military if Ukraine goes? The idea that we could do something in Ukraine, covert or otherwise, and have Putin not respond is just laughable. You know, I feel like a lot of people, of course, feel helpless, especially those of us living within the empire, um, paying and sponsoring all these atrocities with our tax dollars. What can we do from preventing this government, the military industrial complex, from crushing us? The people the American people, or at least a substantial, powerful minority of them, hopefully a powerful majority of them, are going to have to get sick and tired of this. They're going to have to get angry about it, and they're going to have to take action. That's the only thing that I see as a way to salvage this republic before it sinks completely. Um, we are going to have to have a very powerful minority, or hopefully, as I said, a majority, 51%, 52%, who actually stand up on their hind legs and, and, and say, I've had it. This isn't going to happen anymore. You're not getting... Does that mean revolution? It might. It might indeed.